review without quite knowing what was done. Uh, I want to remind you that um, I think what was done was skillfully uh, talking about how the evaluating the thermochemistry of of uh, a gas evaporating, and that would have been done at STP. And by the way, there's actually multiple definitions of STP. There's standard temperature pressure. I think we're using standard thermodynamic temperature and pressure. Uh, the difference is, is that instead of zero degrees, ours is 25 degrees on the temperature. Uh, one bar pressure. Hopefully, Azra mentioned to you that that was because um, it just makes sense. Humanity is not at an atmosphere. Humanity does not live on the beach. Only rich people, <laughs> the president, live in the beach. Um, most of us have to look a little bit inland, and the pressure goes down a little bit. So one bar uh, is the standard pressure. And, and that will not really come back to bite you in any way in terms of like trying to remember that. And what bites you is forgetting that standard temperature is 25 Forgetting that you need to use the Kelvin scale, that will bite you all the time. Um, but, but that one, when, when we do, we're going to be doing problems for the next like three weeks of this nature, and this is just not going to be a big deal. Uh, now, I wanted to remind you that now this is kind of funky because this is occurring at 25 degrees, and we think of water boiling at 100 degrees. So what you can do is uh, figure out uh, the amount of heat it takes to uh, to get the liquid at 100 degrees, uh, how, how much heat does that take? You remember calories in 4.184 joules per K um, of temperature. Okay, then at 100 degrees, uh, it's not exactly hard to measure how much more energy, and it does take more energy to turn liquid to gas. So, um, and I can prove that, you know, when you, when you are boiling water, you turn up the, the stove top, and it starts to boil, you can't just turn off the stove top, right? And that's, that's why, because there's a bit more. Okay, now you're at 100 degrees. And then, as I should have shown you, the thermochemistry it takes to cool this back down, and I'm, I'm not going to write anything, because it should assume at 25 degrees. You can use the heat capacity of, of water vapor to uh, determine what, uh, how, much, how much energy actually is shed to take gaseous uh, water vapor from 100 to 25 degrees. And anyway, in the whole thing, uh, the whole point of that lesson was that all of this is a closed loop. So you can figure out any three parts, you can figure out the fourth part. And that's actually conservation of energy. That's the first law. And everything we're doing with all this Hess's law jazz, all of it is conservation of energy. It, this is all the first law. And uh, anyway, with that said, um, uh, so a little bit more about how this works. And, and this, by the way, this is the most boring lecture of all because this is high school stuff. You know what we're trying to get to is the thermo, all the thermodynamic variables, which is mostly G and H, and sometimes S if I'm feeling a little um, difficult. Uh, so I've got this reaction, I've got that reaction, and now you can figure out delta G and delta H and yada, yada, yada of this reaction. That's kind of what it comes down to. Um, but now, whether you realize it or not, uh, so um, I'm just going to do a bunch of examples, but I want you to look out for something when I do these examples. It turns out that every time I write down just about anything, uh, there, there's always this implicit operation that I'm actually doing this, even if I'm writing down a single, say, chemical reaction. Again, I'm writing down like methane plus oxygen goes to... CO2 plus H2O, if I'm doing that, and I just write down the delta H, I'm actually doing this operation and showing the result. The, the trick is, is that while this is methane and oxygen and this is CO2 and water, what, what is the B then? You know, I, and I'm just showing you this. I'm showing you this, but I'm really decomposing the reaction this way and just not showing you that. And that's because the nature of B is special. And B, what are the B species? The B species are standard elements, are elements in their standard state. But before I get there, anyway, I'm just, I'm just trying to tell you this now. I know it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Then I'm going to do a bunch of examples and this will be clear. But I want you to kind of keep this in your mind. That even when I do delta H of a reaction, CO2, sorry, methane plus oxygen, you know, burning methane and oxygen, CO2 and water, I'm actually doing two different reactions and adding the result. Um, so anyway, with that said, 
before I start adding your reactions, let me remind you something about funky stoichiometry, which is, let's do, a, let me write a reaction. So what I do is I write a reaction, I write delta H, um, and I'll explain all this symbology and the average to some of it, but if not, or just a review, I'll, I'll, re I'll redo it. Anyway, so we react the reaction here, and then we put delta H there, just like your textbook. And note that uh, what I wanted to bring up was that you often have these fractions in your little reaction deal here. Uh, these often appear, and I do not use space well, but anyway. I like to use it mainly a lot. It's, my, it's one of my favorite examples. It's one of the most produced chemicals. I think sulfuric acid is the most produced chemical in ammonia, number two, something like that. Okay, so one thing to get used to is that, again, we often see fractions, which is kind of awkward. Why not use the lowest denominator or whatever that is, lowest common multiple? I don't remember that stuff in middle school. Um, let me, let me before I explain why we're always going to put things in fractions, and it has to do with the identity of B in this Hess's law stuff. Uh, let me just write down delta H. Uh, you got to learn how to scale this first before I can start using it. And uh, yes, remember this this is high school uh, high school level stuff, so you do know this. Uh, now let's say if I was doing this reaction. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to talk about scaling this reaction, and you have to make sure you get delta H's right, and then you'll add them together later. But you got to do this part first right. So let's say that I was working with half a mole of N2. Uh, what would be the delta H in that, in that case if I scale this? Right, right. What would be what, what would she, what should I be using for delta H if, if I've shown you this data and I'm and I'm asking about what about if I only used half a mole of N2? What is this what's the scaling factor? <coughs> or does it scale? This is something like like electrochemistry, all the all the voltages are constant, right? Maybe maybe you don't remember that. But anyway, what what is it for this? This the it's not constant. So what is it? No, 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 it's you got it right, it's negative forty six. The scaling constant is one. One is a scaling cost, and I'm screwing with you people. Jesus, wake up. <laughs> right? So anyway, right, I didn't change anything. Uh, the lesson here is that uh, it is kind of funky, but what you always want to think about is in terms of moles, so you can have half a mole, but as this is written, it's half a molecule. Okay, I can get an N atom, but I certainly not. I, I cannot get three-fifths of an H2. That does not work. Uh, the reason this is done is that you want to describe uh, the formation of one mole of ammonia. And again, I'll explain a little bit more why that is. Of course, if I had one mole of N2, then I would have had... Right, right, there you go, 90, 92, right? Is that right? I can move it right. And then for a fourth of mole, N2, that would have been... Right, minus 23. Okay, now again, this is all energy can't be created or destroyed in the high school level. Um, let me just drop that for now and actually get into stuff that is uh, really infinitely more interesting, which is actually identifying the B thing. So the Bs in any of these chemical reactions I'm about to write. Even if I just write a single chemical reaction, um, it's just, it, it, and I show that it goes to C. Well, again, what you're seeing is actually a combination of multiple things with this B being hidden, but B has an identity. Uh, it is a, uh, God, where is it? Um, element and standard state. Okay, elements in their standard state. So, what you're going to look at, when you look at the tables in the back of the book to answer the questions that I'll ask on homework and then on the test, I'll have probably one simple question on the test, uh, is that, um, uh, here, let, let me actually go back to that example up there. If I'm trying to look for the delta H of that reaction of A goes to C, you might think I'd do delta H and delta G and delta everything else as well. I'm just going to pick on delta H. What you could do is 
determine H of C, and that will mean standard state because we got to we have to have some groundwork uh, ground rules established. Uh, we can do product minus reactant, right? If I can just figure out what the H is of products minus reactants, that's delta H, and that is 100% correct. Nothing wrong with that. Now it doesn't seem like it would be all that hard because I know what the U of something is. And I know what the U, you know, we've been doing U for a long time, right, by equal partition theorem. And then let's see, this would be delta H, and then I'd have to add um, delta PV. And this would be done at constant pressure, so this would be um, uh, P delta V. But anyway, I'm not going to worry about that. Okay, so, so the issue is, though, that it turns out that this is not actually feasible. Oh, sorry, little standard state, little standard state fields there. Um, this is not feasible. Uh, you really don't want to do it this way. It is totally doable that way, but it's actually going to be exceptionally difficult. So this is why you drop A goes to C and you adopt that uh, picture I drew on the top of A goes to B and B goes to C, where B are elements in their standard state. That's why you adopt that. Uh, and the reason is, is uh, you know, I, I've been showing you how to do this, and this is not hard, and that's true, that is not hard. So what the heck? It's because, actually, remember when uh, a long time ago I said u of t is equal to u at uh, some zero uh, temperature plus one half rt times degrees of freedom. Uh, and then we talked about uh, Hg was three halves RT because it has three degrees of freedom and CO2, da 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 da. Okay, we had ignored this. We just crossed it out. It turns out when you're rearranging bonds, you can't. It's actually not zero. It just doesn't matter when a gas expands and gas contracts because there's no bonding, there's no rebonding. But when there is, you actually need to know that that's not actually zero. And I believe that the degrees of freedom would be electrons and protons, right? Those are, that's what bonds are. And if those are no longer interacting, then their degrees of freedom are, are changing, right? Uh, another way to think about it is it takes energy to break a bond, and energy uh, is released when a bond is made, right? Energy to break bonds, energy is released when you make them. Uh, and that would also affect this, this thing. Now, again, knowing what those numbers are is experimentally verifiable, but it is actually much easier to measure the H content, not, not this way, but instead, all right, so instead of doing it this way, just screw that. Instead, you go A to B and B to C, where what you got are delta H of formation, and you add the, another delta H of formation. So this is what you're actually doing. So if we, if we end up with A goes to C, and the delta H, uh, I'll draw this, I'll make this one and two. The total delta H is the delta H1. Again, don't forget standard state. I'll try to always remember that little circle. It is kind of important that, it, that it's there. Um, OK. So, so the difference is, is that you're going to actually do it this. Instead of doing this, forget this, you're actually going to do it this way and B are going to be elements in their standard state. And why? Because that's actually really shockingly easy to do. We have calorimeters that can, you know, I can make anything from elements in the standard state. And if I want to make, what, ammonia, right? I was looking at ammonia. I can just stop, shove uh, hydrogen and NH2, sorry, N2 and H2. I can shove N2 and H2 into a calorimeter, spark it, and make all the ammonia in the world and measure, and measure not, not its H, but it's delta H, and that F means formation, and, um, and that means that I'm making it from its standard state, uh, from elements in their standard state. And then if I do that with everything, uh, so I know what the, I know what the uh, these formation H's are for A's and C's because they're made from their elements from B's. Uh, then, then I can add them together and get the delta H that I would have measured it this way. These would be the same, oh, damn it. Uh, these, these are the same thing. It's just that this is much easier to measure. This is actually shockingly easy to measure. Now, another reason this works is that everything is relative. So instead of taking things relative 
uh, say starting from here, figuring out what, what internal energy is starting at zero degrees, and then adding in R1 half RT times degrees of freedom for everything, instead of measuring it that way, instead, I put everything in a calorimeter, elements in a calorimeter, and I burn them to make what I want, and instead I calculate delta H's, but their formation H's. That's okay because all these V's cancel out. And that's why this delta H is that delta H, because the effective V's cancel out. That's the first law. Okay, blah, blah, blah. I'm kind of rambling right here. Uh, and one reason that this works is because, um, because of this, because if I do this reaction, if I make nitrogen, what's the heat of form, what's the enthalpy or the, uh, of the G of formation of nitrogen gas formed from nitrogen gas? Let me uh, put two relevant parameters up here. What are they? What would be the delta H or delta G of this reaction formation? It's real simple. It's a, right, it's a trick zero. Right. So you see, uh, you can you might think like, well, okay, okay, I get it. So this is this is A from forming from its react from its elements actually kind of in reverse. So this is C forming from its elements. That that's actually done correctly. Uh, well, well, why don't I break down the elements as well? I mean, in other words, you can keep going with this, right? You can just break things down until they're, until they're atoms. Well, no, no, no. Come to a stopping point. What you do is, again, you define what you have a, a reference point, which is STP and elements in their standard states. You just stop there. You just stop with these Bs being nitrogen or hydrogen because you don't need to break those down further because of what I just showed you here. That it's a null reaction. It doesn't take any energy. Uh, to, to exist in the way it does. Okay, now I know this is kind of rambling. This is always a really hard lecture to get across because for one, it's, it's actually shockingly easy. Again, this is high school stuff and I'm gonna start doing those questions. Um, I'm gonna make sure that you see that even when I write this down, I'm gonna make sure that you see that that's actually what's going on. And so it does get a little cross-eyed right now and I'm just not the best at explaining it. I've done the best I can to explain it, not perfect, and try a little harder every year. And uh, now I've, again, I've done my best to explain it. Now let me try to explain it differently with examples. And so examples, I'm just gonna run through a bunch of examples and that will be most of our time today. So today, today's always the easiest day. In fact, I always look at my videos to make sure, you know, again, I keep up to make sure if I thought of something clever to say, I, I say it again. And uh, actually, I was watching a video, and I said, in the middle of class, I said, I'd rather inject my blood with radioactive thorium than give this lecture. So I just remembered to say that again. OK, so examples with Hess's law. All right, I'll write down the reaction. And again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick delta H. I could put delta, pick delta G. And I'm going to write down formation enthalpies. And so I better start with elements in their standard state on the left, and then end with whatever stuff on the right. And so here's an example of something kind of relevant. I tend to pick stuff relevant to energy generation here. I'll talk a little bit more bio stuff a little bit later, but I think this is kind of more important. Um, so I'm going to start with burning. So I, I better start with carbon. Carbon is a solid in graphitic form in its standard state. In other words, uh, what's the most stable form of carbon at STP? Well, it's graphite. So there you go. Uh, and let's add oxygen. There's a current stoichiometry again, which again is not a big deal. You're not really dealing with half an O2 or just an O atom. You're dealing with half a mole. Okay, and then I'm going to write delta H. And it is a formation because I'm, I'm going to give you a number at SDP, and it's a formation because these are elements in their standard state. If that was not true, I could not add that little F there. And that would be F up. Okay, so there we go. Uh, these are in kilojoules. Oh, another thing to look out for, delta H's and G's are in kilojoules, S's are in joules. Just look out for that, but you should know that. Okay, now, uh, okay, so yeah, whatever. All right, here it is. So what? So what is, how can I do this? What, what, would, what can I actually get if I burn uh, a, a pencil in air? What, what do I actually get? Because I don't get CO gas. CO2. Right, you get CO2. CO2. If you got CO, ga CO gas, that would be really bad. 
right? That means no one can have a fireplace in their house. It would kill you, right? So here's what you actually do. And again, I hope that this kind of gets the cross. Yeah, so, so how do I even know this if it's not even doable? Well, again, this is kind of the whole point. Let me, let me do that uh, uh, A, B thing. So um, what do I want to do? I want to do, um, uh, OK, I'm going to do the formation. But let me, let me write down what happens when I do burn uh, carbon. I believe it's called coke when it's in this form. Been learning a little bit more about mining lately, just for the hell of it. Okay, so I'm making CO2, so I don't have a half in the O2. Okay, and again, I, I, I am perfectly capable of getting a calorimeter, so I get with a mole of, of uh, pencil lead and, um, and enough O2. Burning it, the calorimeter spits out a number, that's 393. 3.5. Okay, and it turns out that um, I'm not sure how they practically do this, but here's uh, okay. So like here, here's our A goes to B deal. Um, so I can also do this. I got CO2 goes to CO gas plus one <coughs> half plus one half O2. And that is uh, 283.0. Um, and you know what I bet they did was uh, catalytic converters. Yeah, so I'm sorry, I said I didn't know how they do this practically. Actually, I think they do. I, actually, I think I do. Catalytic converters are in your car to prevent CO buildup because if it gets into your car, it will kill you. And all the laws got changed. Actually, right before I went to grad school, I was 23. And I, I was living in North Carolina. A little girl died. Um, the family was driving. A little five-year-old, I think, died in the back of her car because the, the car was filling up with CO gas. Somehow the parents weren't affected, but it killed the girl. So that's why you have to have a catalytic converter. Its job is to get rid of the CO gas so it doesn't kill you. All right. So I bet you have a, that's how they measured it. They were able to measure the delta H of CO plus O2. <coughs> that goes off pretty easily make CO2 and then they just put a minus sign in front of the number to give me this and then if you add them together um, sorry this is important let's see you cancel out here's another thing I don't think I've shown you yet uh, maybe I should do a little bit of this you cancel out uh, what you had just like a just like a math reaction um, a math equation we had coupled uh, linear equations, right? You had to figure out, you know, A plus B equals 2 and A plus A minus B equals 5 and all that stuff. Uh, what you end up with, well, what you end up with is, is right here, right? It's right up here. I don't need to write it out again. And right, so I had one mole, but I subtracted half a mole from here. This is this. This is here. And everything else is canceled out. And sure enough, this and that is minus 1 tenth. So there you go. Okay, again, now remember, um, uh, here's an example of, um, well, actually, this isn't really an example of what I showed before. I've got a couple more up here uh, that I want to show you, but um, uh, what do I want to do here? So let, me, let me just do some more examples. And, um, uh, plus there is that the age involved, or that the age and or that the age? Uh, well, uh, in this case, yeah, this, uh, I guess the per mole is kind of, sorry, yeah, I've been putting the per mole. Um, what, I've been forgetting my symbology, yeah, that is per, per mole, right? Uh, so when you see numbers in the table in the back of the book, the per mole, that's why I'm kind of prone to forgetting it. The formation is very important, the SVP is important. Uh, everything is written in terms of forming one mole's product. And if you need to deal with more or less, like in the examples I just showed, you just use the scaling behavior that I deleted a little while ago. And I will show off that. So I, I explained that, but I will do so with the example. So you're right, I forgot the per mole. Um, and it, the thing is, I, I tend to forget this because it gets nebulous what I'm talking about. It, it shouldn't be because the definition is molar product formed from elements in their standard state. Again, that's why we have these fractions here. It's not fractions of an atom, although it is written that way. It's fractions of a full mole. 
of a full mold to form one mold of product. So the M is kind of important, but not, not really. I, I tend to forget that one a lot. So uh, thanks for pointing that out. I don't want to, I don't want this symbol if I can help it. Okay, more and more and more examples. Let me write down a bunch of reactions, more reactions of pizza formation, and then manipulate them in such a way that, again, the point is, is that if I write down a reaction A goes to C, and I'm going to actually do methane burning, you will see that that number is actually hiding a bunch of other, the Bs, a bunch of formation entities that are actually added in, and you just don't necessarily know that, or you don't even really need to know it, but it's still there, and you know the whole point of this class is for you to see that. And big picture about any of this, if I ask a question on the test, would be that the first law is totally largely in charge of all these Hess's Law deals. I haven't even defined Hess's Law yet, uh, but I will in a second. So more examples. Ah, oh, here, okay, this is dead. Don't worry, I've got three backups at any given moment. I really did have to change the class. So I must need it all of them. Okay, so um, I don't even know what I'm going to do yet. It doesn't matter. Uh, because I have, uh, just like with the x, the y at constant z, I have a tremendous amount of flexibility. And here's my delta formation. So this is a formation H. Uh, and of course, it's in kilojoules per mole. And this is minus 285.8. Sorry, that's unreadable. There we go. Okay, and element, element, they're both gases. Okay, so that's legit a delta uh, formation. Okay, let's do graphite, uh, carbon plus O2, gas goes to CO2 is of course a gas, and this is the heat formation of CO2, of, uh, and I actually just wrote that down a little while ago. And let's do methane as well, and you can see that I'm slowly building up to um, looking at methane burning, which again is pretty important because that's how we power the planet. Okay, and I just, again, I looked these up in the, in the table in the back of the book which you need for the homework. And if you don't have a book, by the way, come by office hours. I, I printed them out for you. I can't post them on the web because that would get me arrested. That's, uh, that, would, that would be kind of a big deal if I did that. OK, so we have this information. And uh, what do I want to do? Um, OK, so what I want to do is I want to do the, I want to get it right for one. CH is not methane. That would be pretty screwed up. Uh, okay, now again, when you look at the table in the back of the book, all you see is this, this, and this, and in, under the delta H column, you see that, and that, and that. The, the part that, again, you're not seeing is that these are, these are the H's of these chemical reactions, all of which can be measured. All right, now with this, let's make up new ones. All right, let's do this one. Let's do, uh, so I'm just going to start writing stuff, and then you'll, only when I bring them all down will it be obvious what I'm, um, what I'm um, actually getting to, so that, that kind of blows. Okay, and then the delta H. Let me forget the symbology, that's 74.7. Uh, right, so all I've done is I've reversed this. Again, conservation of energy, what goes up comes down, that's literally what that means. Okay, and again, I'm trying to get to burning, I'm trying to get to burning, um, methane and so I know that methane has one carbon so one carbon can only give me one CO2 so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add this guy in and what I like about this is I see that the um, I see that the carbon has now canceled out uh, O2 gas goes to CO2 uh, so this is one you don't have to mess with it just depends what I've asked you to do. Okay. okay. So now I've got my, I can see that I've got methane going to CO2, uh, but it needs to also make water. And let's see here. So that means I need to add this guy here. 
Um, and, uh, and that's good because I know that when I burn methane, I don't make hydrogen gas. That would be crazy if I did. Okay, so again, I've got my methane. Uh, I, I have it reacting with oxygen, making one CO2, which is correct. But right now, it also is producing H2, 2H2. So I need to get rid of that. It also needs to make water, which is missing. So I'm going to add this one in. And I need to add two times that that guy to cancel that. I can go ahead and start canceling things. Again, like in an equation, A plus B is 5, A minus B is 3. Solve the equation, right? Just, just like uh, I had that sophomore year of high school. OK, then I got O2. I'm just multiplying this in my head. It goes to 2H2O. It is important to, to keep track of what phase things are in. I can, I can mess with you if, if uh, oh, wait a minute. Have I, um, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with this? My bad. It's important to keep track of phase. If you get that wrong, you're, you're completely screwed up. It's one of the ways. See what I just did there? I wrote gas because it made sense that water would be a gas. But I gave you the, the equation for liquid, so I, I, I can't get that wrong. Okay, and then this would be 2 times 285, and I have to bring it down as 571.6. Okay, let's see here. Uh, I've actually canceled out everything I think I need to cancel. CH4 gas uh, plus 202. And that actually seems a little funky. I'll see if it adds up in a second here. I got CO2 gas. Sorry, no, this is, I'll toss this up in a second. I know some of you are having a hard time seeing. Uh, okay, I've already taken care of these guys. Plus 2H2O uh, liquid. And I simply sum up all these numbers. I get minus 8, 90.4. Double check me, 90.4. Uh, okay, hold on. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, that does add up. That does make sense. Okay, so anyway, but again, high school level stuff. Um, I'm going to have trouble seeing it. High school level stuff. But remember, the point was that when you see an enthalpy for a reaction, and you just write all that jazz out, you know, methane plus oxygen goes CO2 and H2O, that's the A goes to C. And what you're not seeing is the A to B and B to C, and that's the stuff on top, right? It's, obviously, it's more complex than A's and B's and C's. But anyway, so I kind of hope that that gets the point across is that anytime you read a chemical reaction, what you're not seeing is all the other chemical reactions measured relative to a reference, the reference being an element in the standard state B in my example that I keep citing over and over again. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's how it all works. Uh, actually, last bit, last bit is that this equation is screwed up because you cannot burn methane and get liquid water. That's not going to happen. So what I want to point out is that what you do in that case is you just look up. If you actually had this number, uh, you had this number from last uh, Friday. Uh, how how much energy does it take to burn to sorry to um, to vaporize? Uh, a liquid, liquid water to the gas, and again, this is at SCP, and I better put down two of them. All right, otherwise it doesn't balance. And this ends up being uh, 44 times two. Um, again, you actually had, you actually talked about this last time, so I just want to remind you. And so then the net is CH4. This actually brings up I might as well tell you that the way I try to trip you up on this, um, and, and you know, I'm not just trying to be antagonistic a little bit. Uh, so here, here, now it's a gas, now that makes more sense. And the delta H isn't nearly as negative. Well, it's still pretty negative, and that makes sense. I know that burning, burning methane releases heat, and that's what that negative number means. And some of it gets lost if the water is not in liquid form because some of it gets eaten up to turn it to gas form, which makes a lot of sense. But again, this brings up a point. What I value about this is, well, for one, it's a high school thing, but it's necessary to do the other things we're going to cover from here on out, which is the, the point of this class when it comes to chemical reactions, when it comes to thermodynamics, is to determine the reaction yield 
based on these data, that's what we're really going to get to. That's the thing that's a senior level college uh, idea that we're going to try to get across. But you have to be able to do this first. Again, even though it's high school, if you can't get this part right, then it's over. Then you can't do the rest of it, right? So, uh, and in terms of what I can question you on, something I value, do you pay attention? You know, I value that quite a bit. And this, this, this deal here, this gas versus liquid, that's what I'm going to try to get you. Get you. Yeah, that's why I chase around my cat. I'm like, get you, kid. Uh, anyway. Uh, and that's how I'm going to try to get you on these, is are you paying attention to gases and liquids? Uh, because it does matter, and I just showed you that, and really I don't have anything else I can come up with, to be perfectly blunt. Um, but there is something to be said for paying attention. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so then there's some general handy-dandy formulas, which I'm going to uh, cover, uh, even though they're just stupid, uh, but still. Uh, just to remind you of, and, and actually this is a good way to introduce some terminology, which is a stoichiometric coefficient. Let me just write down the, the silly formulas for this. Again, high school level. My teacher, when I took uh, high school chemistry, uh, because we couldn't really handle a lot of advanced stuff, all we did was Hess's law calculations all the time. Um, and just to remind you that for any generic, I'm going to do a generic bimolecular whatever, um, that these are the stoichiometric, the numbers in front are stoichiometric coefficients. They are very crucial that you, you remember that because that actually has a lot of influence on the thing I'm actually trying to get to, which is using thermochemistry data to calculate reaction yields. These guys matter a heck of a lot, so you've got to remember that. And of course, the formula for uh, a delta H and delta G and yada, yada, yada. It's going to be the sum of products. Products of the stoichiometric coefficient <coughs> times the formation um, enthalpy, so this is for delta H, uh, minus reactants. Stoichiometric coefficient minus their delta H. And delta G. Yada yada yada. Just insert G. Look, I, I hope you didn't even need to write this down, right? This this is just utterly foolish. Uh, well, not foolish, but uh, and let's see, what else do I want to last tell you? Uh, okay, last bit is uh, Kirchhoff's law, and uh, Kirchhoff's law is when you go off temperature, so. Again, I've thrown some reaction at you, whatever it is. I actually prefer to keep it in A, B, C, D form because it makes it generic, right? Uh, I, you will look in the table in the back of the books and look up the H's of formation. You add them up and get the answer right. Again, high school level. Uh, to make it more interesting, let's go off temperature. Let's go off 25 degrees. A lot of reactions, especially in industry, are not done at at STP, so um, if you go off STP, now I'm not going to worry about going off pressure because it's just another exercise and doing the same thing. I'm going to I'm going to talk about going off temperature because that's the most relevant. Uh, people in industry, especially for like methane production, sorry, um, uh, ammonia production, they definitely do not use one atmosphere. But let's, let's not worry about that. Let's talk about going off temperature, which again is very, very common. And that means that you need to do delta H, and you need to do delta G, and you need to do delta S, by the way. But let's start with simple. Let's start with delta H. Um, OK, so delta H is delta U plus delta PV, OK, which is uh, PDS minus PDV. <coughs> Uh, plus PDP, uh, plus B, uh, BDP. Okay, now look at that. These cancel. Okay, so that's not an issue. That last term, does that cancel? BDP? No. Uh, no, hold on. <coughs> Right, right, we're not going to mess with pressure. Right, standard pressure, right. So 
Remember that we're ultimately trying to get to delta G, and delta G is relevant to the constant temperature, constant pressure. So for the purpose of this class, no, I'm not going to worry about changing pressure. OK, and then this is just the change in heat. There you go. OK, now the point of this is that delta H, and I've got to remember how to do this. Uh, what you do is, you, to, to get delta H at a different temperature, I'm going to simple this kind of stuff. To get a delta H at a different temperature, you get the number of the table in the back of the book, which is meant for 25, and then you're just going to add the heat. The heat it takes to warm it up to whatever temperature you had to get to, and that's Cp delta C. Notice that our, our N number of moles times the heat capacity per mole. And, um, and there you go. Okay, now this is where you have a bit of a conundrum. What you could do is fix, all right, so, so you've done this, right? So you had four H's, two products minus two reactants. What you could do is adjust every single one of the H's for A and B and then do it C and D and then recalculate, okay? That's fine, you'll totally get the right answer if you want to do that. And of course, you will be given the heat capacities. Obviously, you have to know that. However, there is a much easier way, although it is actually the same calculation, which is called Kirchhoff's Law. And I'm not going to test you whether you remember Kirchhoff's Law, what the word is. And Kirchhoff really doesn't deserve a lot. This is just the first, everything we're covering is just the first law of thermodynamics, including Kirchhoff's Law. Kirchhoff's Law is a handy way of figuring out delta H at a new temperature without having to adjust every H of every product and reagent. Not that that doesn't work, it does work, it works fine, it's just going to take a while. Now what you do with the Kirchhoff's Law is figure out your delta, uh, notice how I didn't include a little circle up there, I actually was being careful. Okay, so let's do delta H, and, um, and now I'm not going to be doing a formation reaction anymore. And I'm not at standard temperature, in fact I'm at P2. And what you get is the delta H, I notice I didn't include, the I didn't make that a formation, because it's now an actual reaction, not necessarily from standard, not necessarily from elements in their standard state. Um, I am actually trying to be careful there. Okay, so uh, what you do is, uh, I guess I need to promote. Okay, okay, so you've done this from the numbers in the table in the back of the book, and that's right here. And again, instead of adjusting everything, what you do is you multiply delta Cp times delta T to get the delta H at the non-SDP temperature. Okay, and delta, um, delta Cp is this jazz up here, the exact same thing. So, table in the back of the book. H, G, S, a bunch of other stuff, Cp. Okay, so what you do is you get heat capacity of products minus heat capacity of reactants. It gives you a single number. And then multiply that number times the change in T and add that to what you got for delta H, and that's the new delta H. All right, so now the reason, that, now I want to emphasize these, these are the same number. These are exactly the same. Uh, again, when you, when you um, I didn't quite, no, 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 sorry, I didn't quite do that right. Uh, my, my, my point here, sorry, is that these are the, the new delta H's for, for A, B, and C, D, and then you subtract them. If you do that, you will get the same thing right here. This is simply computationally 10 times easier and faster and a lot less, full, a lot more foolproof, sorry, a lot more foolproof to do it this way. And the reason it's totally fine is that it actually is the, um, uh, it, it's just the first law. You're actually mathematically doing the exact same calculations, just in a more compact form. Uh, last bit, let me give you delta G at a higher temperature, and we'll, we'll stop with that. And I, this is on your next homework, by the way. I've got, actually, I thought it was on your present homework, now I'm running it out. But anyway, delta G at another temperature, because delta G is the only thing that matters, is, um, Delta G and TQ. 
that'll become all. Notice I didn't include the standard state. It's going to be the delta H from the table, remember it's in the back of the books. Okay, now what you need to do is adjust that delta H for the new temperature. And um, then so times delta T. Okay, so again, delta G is delta H minus T delta S. I've just shown you how to fix delta H by Kirchhoff's law. And uh, delta S minus T, which is T2 delta S. Again, that will be from the table in the back of the book. And it's calculated the same way as this. And I'm just assuming you know that. Now, this one is a little funkier. It's heat capacity, natural log of T2 over 298. Okay, don't forget there's two brackets. All right. And what I'll have you do on your homework is I, I think I gave you uh, the thermo of uh, ammonia formation, I think. And you show how the delta G is positive, and you show how that changes with temperature, and you'll just use the same. So, anyway, sorry, I went a little.